Now I'd like to discuss what we know as the general chumros, uh, which means simply going beyond the letter of the law. And these are chumros that one doesn't necessarily have to keep, and they have to make decisions whether they will keep them or not. And I'm going to list off a number of rules or halachot uh, that should be followed in cases when you're keeping chumros. Now let's begin by just saying, why does one keep a chumros? I mean, you have halacha, I'm fulfilling halacha, why do I have to go beyond the letter of the law? So, from the Mesil HaSishorim, it would appear that Chumros, in, in, this, in these general circumstances of where Chumros is not really Halacha, you're keeping it either because you're in love with God, we say in love with the one above, or uh, you're in awe of God, meaning you either have Avas Hashem or Yiris Hashem. Let me just bring it out, maybe with a marshal that I think Mesil HaSishorim might even discuss, if a parent asks for a drink. If your dad asks for a drink, so he didn't say what you should bring him, but you happen to know that he loves a milkshake. So you can either bring him water because he just asked for a drink, or you can run down to the ice cream parlor and just get him a milkshake and come back with the milkshake. Now, if one is really in love with a parent, they'll go get him the milkshake because even though they could fulfill their obligation with water, they love the person and they want to do what the person really, really enjoys. That's the same thing when we do a hider mitzvah, or we go beyond the letter of the law in some shape or form, it's because either we love God, or if we're being machmir and not doing something, not eating something which is permitted, maybe something like chol of Yisrael, uh, which would be in certain com communities certainly a chumrah, so that's because I'm in awe of the one above. I can rely upon Ramosha Feinstein, which most of the world does, and uh, I decide not to because I'm in awe of God's, what God commanded me. That's basically the idea of why we keep Chumrah. So we really have to feel that love and awe when we do it. So there are times when, even when one does keep Chumrah for the right reason, Chumrah should be avoided. Now, let, I'll give you a couple of examples so we will, um, we'll, we'll, get a, we'll get an idea here. One of the places where Chumrah should be avoided is uh, when it looks like I'm acting holier than thou. Meaning, uh, I put on, let's say, fill in Rabbeinu Tam in a place where nobody does it. Or I'm eat, drinking Chol of Yisrael where nobody does it. So sometimes that will look like I'm holier than thou. Even though I'm not feeling that, I'm feeling that I am in awe of God or in love with God. But what people see is somebody who thinks that he's got one up on us, right? Certainly, a person should not keep a Chumrah when uh, it does lead to him feeling haughty and feeling like I'm better than you because I'm keeping Chumrah X or Y, right? That's, it's very important that, that a person doesn't do that. And there's a famous sefer called Mincha Shmuel from a student of Reb Chaim Ivalojan who states this explicitly. He feels that people should not keep Chumras unless they are keeping them for the right reasons. Uh, he actually says something very interesting, uh, that because of this, it's very worthwhile when you keep a chumrah to only keep it in private and not keep it in, in public. I just want to give an example of this, that even great people uh, kept their chumras in private. One example is uh, my grandfather, Sephardim Levracha, put on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam after he was 90 years old when he turned 90. Now, Rabbi Yaakov was quite well known as being a very great tzaddik and Talmud Chacham, and yet, he didn't do it in shul. When he came home every morning, he used to put on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam. Uh, why he started putting on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam is a whole story unto itself. We won't go into that right now, but the point is that he decided if he's putting on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam, it can't be in public, even though plenty of people put it on in public, and certainly Rabbi Yaakov would be one that people would think could do it, yet, he was very sensitive and he didn't do it. Another thing is that I caught him, uh, by the way, that's how I found out that he put on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam, was I caught him putting it on in a, in a private room. I walked into the room to speak to him and he had a pair of Tefillin on and I knew that he had just come home from shul. So what was he doing with the pair of Tefillin on? And that's when he told me that at age 90 he began putting on Tefillin Rabbeinu Tam. Another thing is that I saw a lot of, a lot of flour in his freezer one year and um, I asked him, why there's so much flour in the freezer? And he said, he's going to just tell me, but I shouldn't tell anybody, that him and Ramosha Feinstein decided that they're going to be makbar on chadash, 
because a change took place with regard to American wheat. America's wheat now is not old wheat anymore, it's new wheat. Uh, here's again, Ramosha Feinstein or Byakov got together to be Machmer, yet they didn't tell anybody else, and in Rabbi Yaakov's time, he didn't let anyone publish any Svarim on the topic to be Machmer on Chodesh. I want to share with you maybe even another story that's really interesting. The fellow, the Mincha Shmuel, who was a Talmud of Chaim Yivalajan, says that Rabbi Chaim Yivalajan told him that even if you want a Paskin like the Gra, it should only be in private, not in public. In other words, you're doing things like the Gra in public, even in Vilna, you shouldn't be doing them like the Gra, you should do like the Minag of Vilna, but in private, if you want to do the Vilna Gons Chumras or Halachas, you should do them in private. I just want to share with you, I heard from my grandfather, an uh, interesting story. A fellow, a fellow uh, was a Rav in a city, and he, uh, when he passed away, uh, he left two pairs of tefillin. This fellow was a Talmud of Reb Chaim Ivalojin. He left two pairs of tefillin as a Yerusha, and the family was taken aback because they always thought he put on one pair of tefillin. So he writes in his Tzavo, Pair A, you don't need to check, it's kosher. Pair B, you should check before you put on. So the family, of course, did what he wrote in his Tzavo, and they checked the pair of tefillin, they opened it up, and they found empty boxes. It was boxes without any parshios in it, right? And the family realized that on Cholomoed, Sukkot, on Cholomoed Pesach, because he paskin like the Gra, that you don't wear tefillin, and in Lithuania the minig was to wear tefillin, he would put this pair of tefillin on, so everybody thought he's wearing tefillin. And he would really be paskin like the Gra, and no one would know about it. So I wish everybody could do chumras like these, where you're doing the chumra, you're doing it for the right reason, but... If you're doing it for the right reason, nobody has to know about. That's number one. Number two, uh, we should not do any chumra on anyone else's shoulders, right? Like the Ramos says, when you yachmir, yachmir la'atzmo. We don't put chumras on any other people. So if someone has, we spoke about chumra of Rabbeinu Tam, let's say, or chum not to carry, right? It doesn't mean your spouse is not to carry. If, if, if the husband is machmir on Rabbeinu Tam and the wife wants to uh, do the halacha like the minig in Yerushalayim is to do like the gra, then uh, she can do that. And the husband shouldn't put chumras on and say, you can't do malacha before uh, the end of Rabbeinu Tam. Uh, this is uh, something uh, that you should be very conscious of because it does affect, a lot of times, it does affect the spouses when we are machmir, right? So we should know that if you're gonna not carry Yerushalayim, you know that it can't be a fact that your wife has to schlep the stroller up the stairs because you're not carrying your shalayim on Shabbos, right? So this is very important. Another thing that we have to know is that you have to be consistent. If you're machmer mitzvahs between man and God, you have to be machmer mitzvahs between man and man, which Rav Palm in his Sefer points out that just like someone spends extra money on an etrog, someone should spend extra money and be mochel someone when they have an argument about finances. In other words, forego the finances, you forewent $100 or $200 in your, in your etrog, so why when you have an argument with someone over $100 or $200, everybody has to stand their ground. If you're doing lefnima shirt, I didn't, beyond the letter of the Lord, the Chumrah, you should be machmer and benom lechaveru as well. So that's another way of telling how you're doing Chumras properly. Okay? Uh, make sure your Chumrah doesn't become more important than the Halacha, because that is a very skewed way of doing uh, of doing a chumrah, meaning Rav Dessler says that a person who uh, who keeps chumras uh, very 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 uh, uh, appropriately and doesn't keep halacha so appropriately is like a person who has a beautiful tie but is wearing a dirty creased old white shirt. Right? He's got the beautiful tie on, but the garment itself, the mitzvah itself, is not really being done. Uh, properly. And this is extremely important that we know that that's the way you actually look when you're doing a chumrah and, 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 and the halacha is not balanced with the chumrah. You have to realize, like we said before, and this is the, the last thing we'll talk about, is that when, you, when it comes to a chumrah, it should not lead to a kula. We mentioned this before. I'll give you an example. If you're machmer in one area, the famous case of the chassid shota, right? He's very machmer not to see the woman who's not dressed properly who's drowning, 
but he's very maple because he really has an obligation to save the woman, right? So you always have to be careful that when you're machmer in one halacha, it should not lead to a cool in another halacha. I want to give you an example of, um, just to end off, to maybe give you just one interesting, a quick uh, story on, um, on how Rabbi Yaakov was, uh, didn't want to do chumras on other people's shoulders. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov remarried. Uh, his first wife passed away. My grandmother passed away when she was 60. He remarried a number of years later. And uh, Rabbi Yaakov had a minhag that on Fridays he didn't have milk products. His father had this minhag and, uh, and he also had the same minhag. He didn't eat uh, cheese on Fridays. Uh, when he got married, the first year he was married, his wife prepared... Uh, she prepared milchiks on Shavuos, which is a minik to have in the morning on Shavuos when he came home from shul after, after the Nets minion. So she had all prepared, you know, blintzes and cheesecake and stuff like this. And Rabbi Yaakov realized that that, that day of Shavuos came out on a Friday, right? And therefore he was not allowed to have milk products. That was his minhak. Uh, in order not to make her feel bad, when she wasn't in the room, he called three people together and he was matin neder. Right, so he could eat and not make his newly married wife feel bad. This is a this is a classic case when we really have to know that you can't do something on someone else's shoulders. So if we take all these things into account and we do the chumras properly, then we'll have our vodas Hashem being done properly. If we don't, then it's probably a lot better to leave the chumra and focus on hilchas lashon hara, hilchas shabbos. And don't worry about the Chumras. Thank you very much.